Okay, so we'll uh, go ahead and get started with the second uh, portion of our presentations that will focus on systemic therapy. Uh, we'll have our, our three medical oncologists focused on the treatment of kidney cancer speak. Uh, the first will be Dr. Nazar Tanir, who's going to talk about the role of targeted therapy in the treatment of patients with uh, advanced kidney cancer. Nazar? Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. This is my 11th year, and it's great to see uh, friends and uh, survivors. This is why this is called Cancer Survivors uh, Symposium. I, uh, over the last 11 years, we've seen dramatic improvements in uh, therapies, and uh, I, I am very excited about the future. Um, we have hope, and this is why you, know, you are all here. We have more therapies now than we've had, uh, you know, a decade ago. These are my disclosures. Uh, as you heard already from uh, uh, our colleagues, the surgeons, uh, Dr. Wood, uh, Mateen, and Karam, uh, uh, there are many uh, options for treating patients with metastatic kidney cancer. Uh, I, um, I'm, I'll focus my talk on systemic therapies and uh, the uh, main uh, two areas uh, will be the VEGF-directed therapies and the mTOR inhibitors. But radiation has a role for palliation of bone metastasis and brain metastasis. You heard uh, from the surgeons about the role of cytoreductive nephrectomy in the management of metastatic disease. And there's still a role for metastasectomy in some patients uh, where we resect the uh, tumors in uh, different organs, the pancreas, lungs, brain, and that is certainly plays a role in extending uh, uh, the life of uh, some patients. When we are faced with a patient with a diagnosis of renal cell cancer, as you saw from the beautiful uh, photos uh, that Dr. Mateen showed about the different tumors, uh, we are uh, struck with the heterogeneity. That's a word that you, you hear about. It means that renal cell cancer, although it arises in the kidney, it's not one disease. It's uh, one of many different subtypes. Histologically, the way they look under the microscope, but also molecularly. And also, we have for years recognized even the same tumor subtype, the most common, let's say, clear cell. You have patients who do very, very well and survive many years, even if they have metastatic disease. And you have, unfortunately, other patients who are not lucky and they do not survive one year. So there is that heterogeneity that we have uh, recognized. And, and we have developed uh, models, prognostic models, to try to understand who are the patients who survive uh, longer than others and what are these clinical risk factors. So this is the model from the International Metastatic Renal Carcinoma Data Consortium where they looked at performance status. You heard that word from Dr. Wood this morning meaning how is, a patient, is the patient walking, asymptomatic, still working, driving, physically active, or does the patient have pain and uh, has lost weight and has fatigue? So that's an important risk factor. So KPS is Karnofsky performance score less than 80%. That's a risk factor. That's a patient who really needs some assistance, not able to do the things that they used to do. And if the diagnosis to initiation of therapy is under one year, that happens if a patient presents with advanced disease and they have the mass in their kidney. Or if they had surgery, as you saw from uh, the slides of Dr. Wood, if they had surgery and the cancer recurred and metastasized shortly after surgery, within a year, that's not good news. That's a risk factor for uh, prognosis. If they have low hemoglobin, anemia, if they have hypercalcemia, that's a high serum calcium in the blood, or if they have elevated white blood cell count in the blood, or if they have elevated platelet count. Each one of these six factors is a risk factor that's affect, that influences survival adversely. And when you look at patients who have none of these, this is represented with the blue curve on top, those patients survive an average of, you know, three and a half, four years. Those who have one or two of these risk factors that I showed you 
have an intermediate prognosis and they survive little less than two years when they have metastatic disease and are treated with the agents I'm going to be talking about, the target agents. And unfortunately, those who have three or more of these risk factors, even with the therapies that are available, that are FDA approved, unfortunately, their survival is not good with around eight to nine months. You've seen this slide uh, from Dr. Wood's talk. Since 1992, when only high-dose interleukin-2 was FDA approved for the treatment of renal cell cancer, since then, we have had seven agents come to the clinic. The first one was sorafenib uh, in December 2005. That came 13 years after the FDA approval of high-dose IL-2. So it took 13 years before we really had anything effective. But since then, we're lucky that we had several agents, as you see here, a month after sorafenib was FDA approved, sunitinib uh, came to the clinic. And then in 2007, tamsirolimus, the uh, mTOR inhibitor. Then in 2009, three therapies. And again, I'll go into the details with each one of these. And then about three years ago, axitinib was the last one. I anticipate there will be more uh, therapies, more agents, more drugs added to this timeline in the next uh, few years. This is a summary slide of the therapies that are licensed by the FDA for the treatment of metastatic renal cell cancer. So first, in the first column, you have the agent or the regimen, then the mode or the route of administration, IV intravenous or oral, the type of agent, what targets the agent or the therapy is after, and then the indication by the FDA. So bevacizumab plus interferon alpha, bevacizumab is IV, interferon alpha is given subcutaneously, that's the old cytokine. They target, bevacizumab targets the VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor, and it's indicated for the management of advanced renal cell carcinoma. Everolimus is an oral agent, it targets mTOR pathway, and it's indicated for the treatment of patients with metastatic clear cell renal cell carcinoma after they've had other therapies with tyrosine kinase inhibitors, specifically sunitinib or sorafenib, but that can be extended to other tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Pazopanib is an oral agent, and again, it is like sunitinib, sorafenib we'll be discussing. It targets vascular endothelial growth factor receptors 1, 2, 3, but other uh, kinases as well, and it's indicated again for the treatment of advanced renal cell carcinoma. Sorafenib targets, again, similar to the other, except it targets RAF, BRAF, that's a different uh, pathway. Again, it's indicated for the treatment of advanced renal cell carcinoma. Although the study that, uh, and I will allude to it uh, in the next few slides, the study that led to this uh, uh, drug being approved was conducted in the salvage setting, in the second line setting. But since it was the first agent that came to the clinic, it was given broad indication for approval. Sunitinib, an oral agent, again, it's in the class of the TKIs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, targets those pathways predominantly here that's relevant in renal cell carcinoma is the VEGF pathway, and it's indicated for the management of patients with advanced renal cell carcinoma. Tamsirolimus, IV, mTOR inhibitor, similar to Everolimus, but this is IV, and it's indicated for patients with advanced renal cell carcinoma. Now, in Europe, the indications are a little different than the, uh, in the U.S., in Europe, this drug is FDA ap if, if, if approved by the European agency only for patients who have poor risk disease, and as I defined it for you. Axitinib was the last one, and it's a, an oral agent, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Targets pretty much similar to the other agents, but it is more selective, more potent against the VEGF receptors, and it's indicated for the second line uh, uh, indication or uh, use after failure of one prior therapy. So this is a summary of the first line phase three trials. There were two trials using the bevacizumab plus interferon, one conducted XUS, and that's called the Avorin trial. It was an industry-sponsored trial. And the control arm for the bevacizumab plus interferon was placebo for bevacizumab, IV placebo, plus interferon alpha. You see the number of patients, uh, several hundreds you know, if you look at uh, the, the summary here, 
the column to your right, the, to, the second one from your right, many hundreds of patients are needed when you do a phase three trials. That's the, the, the issue, and this is what the cost, as was alluded earlier this morning. And the primary endpoint is uh, in the last column on your right. Then you go down the line, bevacizumab plus interferon, a study done in the US, com comparing bevacizumab plus interferon with interferon alone, Again, several hundred patients, 732 patients to be exact. And, and the primary endpoint for these two trials was overall survival. Pazapanib was uh, conducted in two cohorts of patients. Those who never had any prior therapy, we call that treatment naive, and those who were treated with a cytokine. What I'm showing you here with an asterisk are those patients who, are, who were treatment naive, did not have any prior therapy. And that's why you see a smaller number of patients. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival. What does progression-free survival, for those of you who are asking, what does it mean? It means the time from you initiate therapy until, unfortunately, death of the patient or progression of the disease, and you change therapy. So that's, that time is called progression-free survival. And it's a, uh, considered a surrogate for overall survival, which would be a, a more robust or more uh, relevant, stricter, uh, primary endpoint, but it's been FDA approved. The, the, uh, the FDA does approve progression, has approved progression free survival as primary endpoint for a lot of those studies. And then when you go down the list, sunitinib was compared to interferon in 750 patients. Uh, and as you see, most of these trials were conducted one to one, meaning one patient randomized to one arm of the trial, one drug, the other patient is randomized to the other. But there were two trials here where the randomization was two to one. Pazapanib was ran, the patients were randomized two to one, meaning two patients randomized to Pazapanib for one randomized to placebo. Tamsiralmus, this was a three arm study. It was, Tamsiralmus was compared to interferon or the combination of Tamsiralmus plus interferon. 626 patients uh, it took to uh, do the study. And the primary endpoint was overall survival. And that's the only study among, among all those uh, trials where the primary endpoint was survival and it was met. And that's why the FDA approved it for advanced real cell carcinoma. Now, tifosanib was a phase three trial with a drug that uh, unfortunately didn't make it because of uh, design issues. Uh, it did meet the primary endpoint of PFS, progression-free survival. When it was compared to sorafenib, it had a longer uh, PFS than sorafenib, but the second line survival was, did not, was not, and there was inferior to sorafenib, and therefore the FDA did not approve it, and therefore this drug did not make it. Axitinib was compared to sorafenib uh, in the first line, but although numerically the progression free survival was longer with axitinib compared to sorafenib, it did not meet the pre specified uh, goal, and therefore. The FDA did not approve axitinib in the first line, but it approved it in the second line, as we'll see here. So this is a summary now of phase three trials. Again, you see the numbers, hundreds of patients required for each one of these trials to complete and reach the endpoint. <clears throat> the first one that was uh, conducted in the salvage setting was the TARGETS trial. That's the acronym for sorafenib versus placebo after cytokines. 903 patients were treated on that trial, and uh, the, it, the, 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 the sorafenib uh, results were better than with placebo in the second line setting with the progression-free survival, double almost with sorafenib than placebo. That led to the approval of sorafenib. Everimus was conducted versus placebo in the record one trial, and again, uh, more than 400 patients were uh, treated. And it did meet the primary endpoint of PFS versus placebo. Again, about double the duration, double the PFS time with Everimus compared placebo. Axitinib was compared to sorafenib in the AXIS trial. And this was a trial where patients who had either sunitinib upfront or interferon or high dose IL-2 or tamsirolimus or bevacizumab plus interferon were allowed to uh, receive axitinib or sorafenib. Primary endpoint was PFS, and for the whole group, this was met, and that's led to the approval of axitinib uh, in this uh, setting. Uh, Tamsirolimus was compared as a representative of an mTOR inhibition strategy 
versus Surah Fanit after Sunnah Tanit. So this was a second line study. It, uh, the study was called Intersect. The primary endpoint was PFS. Again, uh, almost uh, more than 500 patients uh, enrolled. While numerically the PFS was longer with Temsiralamus than with Surafinit, what uh, uh, was concer of concern is the secondary endpoint, which was overall survival, was inferior in patients who had, uh, were treated with Temsiralamus. 12 months was the median OS with Temsiralamus versus 16 with Surafinit. That uh, uh, put a, sh a cloud over the role of Temsiralamus as second line therapy after Sunitinib. Dovitinib was uh, recently uh, conducted. This is a trial called the GOLD trial. It, the, this drug, Dovitinib, targets BFGF and VEGF. It was felt that targeting a different pathway could circumvent the resistance that uh, patients develop uh, with treatment with VEGF uh, inhibitors. Unfortunately, the trial was negative, even though it was, again, more than 500 patients treated. The progression free, the PFS was almost identical with dovitinib and its control arm, the sorafenib. The survival median average was 11 months as third line therapy. This was a trial that was conducted after a patient had at least one tyrosine kinase inhibitor and one mTOR inhibitor. So, what about combinations? of these target agents. I heard the question asked this morning, if one drug is good and another one is good, can we combine and do better? And as Dr. Wood mentioned, unfortunately, these studies were done, including one of our own we published uh, last year, combining sunitinib plus temsirolimus. We thought, you know, this agent targets the VEGF pathway, the angiogenesis, the other one, the mTOR, why not combine these two and do better? Again, toxic, more toxicity, that's what we observed, and unfortunately, the, the results with the combinations were not better than single agents alone given sequentially. So what about sequential therapies? There are several trials that have uh, looked at, and some are ongoing, including our own, I'll discuss in a minute. This is a trial that was conducted in Germany called the SWITCH trial, looking at the sequence of sunitinib followed by sorafenib, two TKIs versus sorafenib followed by sunitinib. Results were better for sunitinib in the first line compared to sorafenib in the first line, but when you look at the overall picture, there is not much difference. This is a trial that was uh, uh, run by Novartis, looking at everolimus followed by sunitinib versus the standard of care sunitinib followed by everolimus, and the results in almost 500 patients were in favor of sunitinib as first line, had a longer PFS, and the survival of the sequence of sunitinib followed by everolimus was uh, better than the survival of everolimus followed by sunitinib. This is the STAR trial, a, a trial that we've been conducting here at MD Anderson, looking at three different agents targeting three different uh, uh, pathways. Bevacizumab is an antibody against VEGF A, and pazapanib is the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, as we discussed targeting VEGF receptors, and everolimus the mTOR uh, inhibitor. So patients who have had their kidneys removed will enroll on this trial, and they get one of those six sequences, either bevacizumab followed by everolimus, bevacizumab followed by pazapanib, pazapanib followed by bevacizumab, pazapanib followed by everolimus, everolimus followed by bevacizumab, or everolimus followed by pazapanib. So the goal here is not to just look, look at the first line, which we will do, and the second line, but also the, the goal is to look at what happens from when they get enrolled on the trial and they receive two sequential therapies in the same trial. What happens? What's the long-term outcome? Can we predict who are the patients who respond to bevacizumab versus pazapanib or everolimus? What kind of toxicities do we see when we uh, sequence these drugs back-to-back uh, -back in the same patient? We're learning a lot from this trial. We have tissue collected from the kidneys that uh, the patients, uh, uh, you know, we removed on the patients, and we have blood collected at different time points. So this is a trial that's rich with information, and we hope to have the results uh, soon. 
Another trial we're conducting in that poor risk category of the patients that I told you, the survival is unfortunately, even with therapy, eight or nine months. We're looking at the uh, drug that's now considered uh, first-line therapy for these patients with poor risk disease, Tamsirolimus, and we're looking at the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, Pazopane, to see if uh, there will be some patients who will respond to Pazopane better than they will respond to Tamsirolimus. So how do I treat my patients uh, with uh, metastatic renal cell carcinoma in 2015? Uh, what are the uh, indications? What setting? What disease type? And here is a, 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 a summary. This is similar to the slide you, you saw with Dr. Wood. In the first line setting, if a patient is previously untreated, they come to us. As I said at the beginning, you need to look at histology. We need to discuss with the pathologist the type of tumor the patient has. Is it clear cell? Is it some of these rare non-clear cells? That's important. And then you, you look also at the prognostic factors. Remember we, the things we talked about, perform status, anemia, high calcium, etc. So if they have good or intermediate risk, I think the data that I showed you, those uh, phase three trials that I summarized for you in the table, sunitinib or pazopanib, I consider are the two first line therapies that now are actually, uh, sunitinib has been on the market a little over nine years, pazopanib five years, but these are the two front runners that patients uh, are being treated with in the community as well as academic centers. Now, bevacizumab plus interferon alpha from the two phase three trials that I showed you still has good data, but in my opinion, this combination is uh, using an IV drug every two weeks plus an injection a parenteral, an injectable a drug interferon that has a lot of side effects, even if it's given at low dose, and it's given every uh, other day, so three times per week. It's not practical, it's cost is an issue. And in my experience, after three, four years, if they respond to this, a lot of those patients are dropping out from treatment because the bifacizumab, after a few years, patients develop nephrotic syndrome. So in my opinion, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor in the first line setting will be the uh, front runner, should be the off protocol if the patient is not being considered for a clinical trial, should be uh, treated with. I put alternative high dose IL-2. This is a therapy uh, that's been around for 30 years. We are celebrating the 30th anniversary of high dose IL-2. Since in 1985, it was uh, first uh, declared to be uh, an effective therapy in melanoma and renal cell carcinoma. But it's really reserved for a select few patients who are really candidates for it. Not every hospital has that therapy or has the experience, so it is reserved for a few patients. Poor risk, we talked about tamsirolimus, but I think you can also, we can also from the phase three trial, there were some patients treated with poor risk uh, with sunitinib, so as an alternative, it is uh, uh, an option. For patients who had prior cytokines, hydrozal 2 or interferon, axitinib, sorafenib, or pazopanib have data from phase three, but in my opinion, it is axitinib, or pazopanib, but mostly axitinib. Why? Because the data with sorafenib was inferior to the, uh, uh, compared to axitinib in the access trial. If you remember, I showed you that axitinib was better than sorafenib in the access trial in the second line setting. And it, it produced double the PFS uh, compared to sorafenib. So although there is phase three data, the first trial that was conducted, I think now sorafenib is basically uh, a, a, a rarely used in, uh, in the clinic these days, unless it's a clinical trial. Now, if the patient had a prior VEGF like a sunitinib or pazopanib, what options do we have? I think the two trials, Everolimus from the record one and axitinib are there. Uh, there is a, a debate that's ongoing and will probably continue for a while. Is it better to use axitinib or Everolimus? I think there is uh, emerging data to suggest that uh, TKI followed by TKI probably is better than TKI followed by an mTOR inhibitor. But I think this debate is going to be changing quickly as now we have emerging uh, effective therapies with the immune checkpoint. So I think this whole field here, this is how we are talking about it today, off protocol in the community, what uh, things we can do. But really, this is going to change tremendously as we have new drugs uh, coming to the clinic as well as the immune check, the exciting, promising immune checkpoints. But uh, let me just say that, in my opinion, 
even with the immune checkpoint inhibitors coming, and this will be the talk of Dr. Gao, there will be a lot of uh, many patients who will not respond, who do not respond to immune checkpoints, but respond to target therapies. And likewise, there will be patients who do not respond to target therapies, but will respond to the immune checkpoints. So by no means, by, uh, I do not believe that uh, these drugs are going to be uh, uh, put by the wayside or going to be uh, uh, a footnote in the history, at least not in the next few years. So there will be a role for these uh, agents still to be played in the treatment of our patients. What about non-clear cell? Briefly, non-clear cell is a uh, rare a group of diverse uh, entities, but just in the interest of time to just let you know, we did a, uh, the only uh, trial that's uh, presented that's randomized looking at an mTOR inhibitor and sunitinib, and this is the design. We took patients with different histologies, papillary, chromophobe, unclassified, or translocation. We randomized them to an mTOR inhibitor, Everolimus, or sunitinib, and, and, and the results were uh, disappointing in that the response rate with Everolimus in the first line was 2.8% and 6% with sunitinib. Although numerically the results were better, PFS and OS with sunitinib, the results were not statistically significant. So where does that leave us? I think in a non-clear cell, the, the patients who have papillary, chromophobe, et cetera, these two drugs have very modest activity. Although there are trends with longer PFS, if you give sunitinib in the first line and longer OS, the, those results did not reach significance. There are higher uh, grade of toxicities with sunitinib. Chromophobe usually does better with these two agents, but our message is patients who have papillary chromophobe, et cetera, should be enrolled on a clinical trial because there is no established effective therapy in, my, in our minds uh, in, uh, right now for this diverse group of rare tumors. What about the new agents? Dr. Jonas will discuss that. But there is a trial that j completed accrual, 650 patients last November. We await the results. This is a phase three trial looking at a CMET inhibitor, which is also inhibitor of Axel and uh, VHF receptors versus Everolimus after patients had already progressed uh, on uh, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. The primary endpoint, as you saw with the majority of these trials, is progression-free survival. So the results of this trial are uh, awaited with earnest. There is uh, a, a theme that has emerged over the last 10 years, treating these patients with tyrosine kinase inhibitors, targeting the VHF pathway. Uh, can we predict which patients respond? And uh, this is a major focus of our research about predictive markers of response. So there are some clinical criteria or clinical factors that help us predict which patient respond to these therapies. For VEGF receptor uh, inhibitors, hypertension, hypothyroidism, hand foot skin reaction, and fatigue, asthenia, have been found to be, uh, it's a double-edged sword. Patients develop these side effects, but that's an indication that the, uh, the drug is working or will work. I wanna finish the talk with two exceptional uh, uh, responses to just give you hope that there is uh, a role for target therapy uh, and I think that that role will, re will maintain, will remain. This is a lady, this is a, a gentleman who presented uh, nine years ago with a mass in his left kidney. He had anemia. We were going to enroll him on one of the pre-surgical protocols we, we had with the biopsy of his left kidney mass. He had clear cerebral sarcosinoma. He had anemia, high LDH. And uh, he was treated initially with sorafenib. That was, remember, the first drug that was FDA approved. Unfortunately, he had rapidly progressive disease and developed bone metastasis and progression of his disease in the liver and lungs, and we changed the treatment to sunitinib. And here are his scans. After a few uh, months of therapy, we could see that without even treating his uh, brain metastasis, which were small, but we did not give him any radiation or anything to the brain, the brain metastasis cleared up, the lung metastasis cleared up, the mass in the kidney shrank, you could see it, and then here are more of the pictures, the, looking at the lungs, the chest, the liver, and the bone, how it's healing. The brain metastasis went away, and after five and a half years of sunitinib, uh, we decided he's in complete remission. Why don't we take the kidney out? Uh, although it would have been, uh, we, we, people would have thought we're crazy if we did it up front, rightly so. 
So we, uh, he developed also hypertension, so we stopped the drug, and after we controlled his blood pressure, the, the patient had a laparoscopic left radic nephrectomy by Dr. Jose Karam, and long and behold, there was no viable tumor in the kidney. So this patient not only achieved a complete clinical response, but achieved a pathological response. We were so excited, uh, we published this paper uh, just a few months ago. Um, he's off therapy now for more than three years, not re receiving anything. So this is a patient who came with cancer in every organ, bone, lung, liver, brain, and he's alive without disease nine years later, three, more than three years without taking any systemic therapy. This is the other patient I would like to mention uh, who presented with abdominal pain and was found to have a big mass in her left kidney and workup showed a 15 centimeter. This is a huge mass in the left kidney that was touching a buttock, the spleen, and distal pancreas, had uh, enlarged lymph nodes, but did not have metastasis to lungs, bone, liver like the other gentleman. But she was anemic, she had high serum LDH. So again, these are criteria, as Dr. Wood was mentioning, you know, people are different. This, the biopsy of this mass was chromophobe. This is one of those rare non-clear cells I talked about. Dr. Wood operated on her. She had a left radical nephrectomy and splenectomy. She had uh, chromophobe RCC, but worse than that, she had 30 and 40% sarcomatoid dedifferentiation. This is a very aggressive tumor. And I tell the patients when they have, unfortunately, sarcomatoid in their tumor, this is like turbocharge. It's like fuel add to the fire. Unfortunately, a little over a year after she had her surgery, she had disease in her lungs, and she developed metastasis in the left supraclavicular area, which was biopsied and confirmed the metastasis. So she was enrolled on the ESPM trial that I showed you, that I discussed with you. She got first-line therapy with sunitinib. She had a good response, partial response, for about uh, several months, but unfortunately had progressive disease with metastasis to a new area in the left external iliac lymph nodes, which were biopsied and confirmed. So she was crossed over. That's after they received the first line. We, we tried the second line in the same trial. She was switched to the Evrolimus, and she has achieved a good partial response. Now continues to respond for over two years, close to three years, without significant toxicity. And you can see on the scans her, her lymph node. Uh, now, this is what we come to now. This is where research is going. Why these two patients had such a dramatic response, and others unfortunately didn't. Everybody wants, if they're patients or they have loved ones who are patients, want to have a scenario like these two patients. So what's different about these patients? So this is the, what I believe the next uh, phase is the promise of genomic medicine for precision medicine or personalized uh, care. We uh, harvest these tumors, we take blood from them before treatment, after the treatment, to try to understand why these two patients responded and others did. So that's the, the exceptional responders protocol we have. We have several trials, as I said, and we are uh, uh, doing this research to try to predict biomarkers of response. We are uh, analyzing tissue from these tumors as well as metastasis use, using next generation sequencing and SNP arrays on fresh frozen tissue from the operating room directly when we freeze it if we have available uh, fresh frozen tissue or formerly fixed paraffin embedded tissue and looking at the extremes uh, on the spectrum. Those are rapid progressors, unfortunately don't respond to anything, and unfortunately don't survive past one year, and those are like these two patients surviving many years. We also are checking blood, as Dr. Wood mentioned, to look at circulating biomarkers, microRNA, cell-free tumor DNA, and calf cytokines and angenic factors to try to understand who are the patients who respond to this drug or the other. And the STAR trial I discussed with you, that's, that's the venue where we think we can learn a lot from uh, uh, taking uh, blood and testing for these biomarkers and response to this agent or the other or the other. So in conclusions, as of today, we have seven target agents approved. Uh, improvement in progression-free survival has been shown with all agents, but improvement in OS with temsirolimus. Complete response and durable CRs for five plus years are rare, but still possible as I showed you. 
I think it's imperative that early and active management of adverse events will minimize those delays, those reductions, and uh, treatment discontinuations, and may impact long-term benefit. Adverse events may be predictive biomarkers of therapeutic benefit, as I mentioned. Sequential monotherapy is the standard of care in 2015, but this field may be cha is changing rapidly. The optimal sequence is still yet to be determined. As I mentioned, uh, so far there is no established systemic therapy for advanced non-clear cell RCC, and only through insights into the biology of RCC that we will be able to identify relevant targets and move the outcome. I believe there is still a role for old immunotherapy hydrozyl 2, but I see that role diminishing as we have the uh, new kid on the block, the immune checkpoint inhibitors coming, and, uh, and we are uh, participating in these trials with immune checkpoints targeting PD-1 and PD-L1 and CTLA-4, and I believe this is the next uh, emerging strategy that will uh, produce, uh, that will break the cure uh, barrier for many patients. I, th I would like to finish with uh, my acknowledgments here. Yeah. Okay. So I would like to thank you sincerely for coming today. I think uh, thank you for your trust. Thank you for uh, allowing us to enroll your loved ones and yourselves, if you're patients, on our clinical trials. You inspire us every day and remind us of the urgency of our research to make kidney cancer history. Thank you very much. Are patients with metastatic kidney cancer who come to MD Anderson, do they have blood drawn to test for the things I mentioned about? And the answer is yes. We do have a collaboration with uh, Dr. Shifeng Wu, and she is in the cancer prevention uh, uh, population science uh, department where blood is collected on these patients in our department as well as in her departments to look at risk factors, because I think that's, I think, what the, the, where you're aiming with your question. Why do patients develop kidney cancer to begin with? So I think this is uh, uh, the thrust of her research, and we're collaborating with her. But we also are collecting, in clinical trials, you know, blood on these patients, so we can study, as I said, the effect of therapies, why some patients respond to this drug, why others respond to a different drug. So yes, it, does, it is done uh, in patients who are, who agree, to uh, give blood, so, so every, there is a consent. So every patient that shows up with medical disease will be referred or consented. Not every single patient, but I think the vast majority of the patients have given blood, have consented to these front door uh, uh, protocols, lab protocols. Some are within the context of clinical trials, therapeutic trials, but even others, as I mentioned, we've actually published many. Uh, manuscripts on the risk factors uh, from blood collected of, uh, of pa from patients. Yes, ma'am. I think right now uh, what uh, is more important uh, and is used to determine which patient goes to trial is more biopsy, it's the pathology. It's, it's not the blood, but it's more the uh, tissue obtained either from the nephrectomy at the time of surgery or a biopsy. And, and I didn't have, for the interest of time, didn't speak about what we're doing. So you have all these therapies that are FDA approved. But if patients receive them and they have progressive disease, where do we go next? Instead of just taking a drug off the shelf and give it to the patient, we're looking at their genomic uh, profile, the gene mutations and other things to determine if we find something in that tumor that's unique about that tumor 
then we can advise the patient to go on a trial that's biomarker based. It's based on the genomic uh, characterization or the gene mutation from that tumor. So yes, there is, that's the effort now of phase one department at MD Anderson. Rather than just uh, taking empirically a drug here and drug there and give them what is available uh, at that time. Rather than that, it's more precise, more uh, based on the biopsy result, what mutations in what genes, and do we have a, a drug for that. So it's called actionable gene and target therapy towards that actionable gene. Now often, we do a biopsy or the nephrectomy even, and we don't have anything that we can target, that we can go after with a specific treatment. But I think this is better than the, the old ways, how we, we used to do it in the days of old, where you just take a drug and give, and we don't find any benefit. So every patient that has a biopsy, a tissue biopsy, of, of the tumor, they need to have a biopsy. Yeah, yes, of course. Yeah, it's no longer we're beyond just uh, taking a biopsy to say, okay, you got kidney cancer and it's chromophobe or papillary or clear cell. We're now interested in the molecular, uh, uh, you know, diagnosis. We're interested to know what genes are mutated, what kind of particular tumor we can go after with one of these smart drugs. Any other questions? Happy to take questions later on if you want after the... So to stay on time, we can 